everyone, thank you so much for coming to the North Philadelphia Teach-In. Uh, we welcome all storytellers and history lovers. Uh, we started this morning by having the Fairmont Park Trolley pick folks up at uh, historic locations. First, the Church of the Advocate at 18th and Diamond, and then the, uh, the old, new trolley horn at 33rd and Dolphin. And we headed from there to Mount Pleasant Mansion at 3800 Mount Pleasant Drive. That is actually where our event was scheduled to be held. Uh, but Mount Pleasant is a very old and right now cold building because the heat is not on. And uh, so thankfully, uh, <laughs> thank you Connie uh, for graciously Thank you, Connie, for graciously allowing us to hold this event here at Historic Strawberry Mansion, which is, to be honest, much more beautiful and much more comfortable. Uh, Mount Pleasant is not scheduled to reopen again until, what, 2019, 25? They will be done a year from now. A year of the restorations and the collections, and we put collections back in, art museum collections will be spring of 2020. So we have some time to play around with next year. Uh, there will be heat, supposedly, as of <laughs> there is supposed to be heat. So we can do things next summer and fall as well, but not sort of the grand opening until spring of 2020. So my name is Denise Valentine. I know everybody knows that. Uh, AKA Story Mama. I'm a professional storyteller and uh, historical performer and um, I'm just obsessed with history, especially the history of African Americans in the city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, oh, that reminds me to turn on. Yep. Turn on. Turn on. Turn on. Okay. So uh, I was artist in residence this summer at historic Mount Pleasant um, uh, mansion, which uh, was a plantation during the time of the French and Indian War before the Revolution. And um, the purpose of that residency was to help the Philadelphia Museum of Art, who has a stewardship over that um, historic mansion and a couple of others, uh, to uh, include the story of Africans who were enslaved there uh, into interpretation and programming for Mount Pleasant in the, you know, in the future uh, when they reopen. The fact that Mount Pleasant is empty right now and you kind of have to use, along with the archives, your own imagination um, to, to see or sense uh, what went on at that house is, is a benefit in a way because it's stripped of the usual interpretation. Uh, so many uh, historic sites have uh, focused on architecture um, and the, the fine furnishings and other uh, material that belong to the wealthy families who owned these homes. Less often do you hear the stories of not only um, the, the ordinary folks who lived in, and worked in those houses, um, but uh, the, in, the people who were enslaved there. Strawberry Mansion is an exception to that. They do an excellent job of interpreting uh, the stories uh, related to slavery here at uh, Strawberry Mansion. And uh, I'm, I'm not gonna go into that. If, um, if I may, I'd like um, Connie to tell you a little bit, of just a very little bit, sorry to put you on the spot, about Strawberry Mansion. And then I'd like each of you, please, to introduce yourself, uh, presenters and other guests, introduce yourself and say a little bit about why you're here this morning. Hey, hi, I'm Connie Ransdale. Um, Strawberry Mansion was built in 1789 by Judge William Lewis. In 1780, William Lewis wrote the first bill in the United States to abolish slavery. And it was just for the state of Pennsylvania. It was a state law. And in the bill, it read that if you 
were a slave owner, and you brought your enslaved people into the state of Pennsylvania, and they were here for six months or more, they would automatically be free. And then they had all the provisions along with it. And that was well and good, and it was passed by the Pennsylvania legislature, so it's still a bill on the books. And um, in 1790, this little bill became sort of troublesome. In fact, the 1790 Congress called it the pesky little law. <laughs> and in um, 1790, the United States Capitol, or the government, moved from New York to Philadelphia. Three-fourths of, uh, of the senators and congressmen were slaveholders. And so naturally, they brought their enslaved people into the state of Pennsylvania, George Washington being the most noted, and um, a whole bunch of other people. And they kind of overlooked this law. But after six months, when their enslaved people began to walk away, then all of a sudden it became a very serious problem. So Congress decided that they needed to enact some law or move or do something that would kind of quell this bill. But Congress can't act on state laws. So in the Residency Act of 1790, there is a little provision that says that the United States government has to find a place where they can sit where they are not encumbered by state laws, not just our law, but any law, and that was called the Residency Act. And by 1799, they had come across this patch of land between Maryland and Virginia that neither state wanted because it was swamp. <laughs> and they moved themselves there, and it's not a state, and they called it the District of Columbia. In 1799, Washington had died, so in memoriam to him, they called it Washington, the District of Columbia. That's one reason why they moved. There are lots of other reasons, but this bill was one of them. So in the meantime, Judge Lewis acted, um, he was a judge. He was appointed by uh, George Washington to the federal um, well, the Supreme Court of the state of Pennsylvania. Um, all through his life, he was a staunch abolitionist. We have a lot of his bills that are still on the records of the Library of Congress, where he went to court for um, enslaved people who had come to Philadelphia, stayed for six months, and um, and he helped them gain their freedom because African Americans at that time couldn't defend themselves in court, so he would go for them. So that's the story in brief. So. Yes. No, I was quite wondering about that. William Lewis, the lawyer. How, how old was he in 1780 when they made the act? He was a young man. I can't tell you. He was not an old man. He died in, um, so you can do the math. He died in 1819, and he was like 69. So, <laughs> so he was born, sounds right, 1750. He was Yes, he was a young man. This was, a, he grew up as a Quaker in Chester County. Mm -hmm. And so he was already involved in abolition and you know humanitarian acts so you know this was not something that he thought of as an older person. Hi welcome come on in. Thank you. We just got started everything. So I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what led you to do this work? Um, what what's your do you have a personal connection to this history and what led you to do this work? I have been doing this work, not in this house, but all over the place. I've been at the Johnson House, which is, yeah, Jackie and I, we were at the Johnson House together. And that was, um, that's a underground railroad station that we know about. So I was there. Then I went on to Clifton which is the Chew Mansion, which was uh, one of the largest slaveholders 
um, of the period at that time, and that's right at Johnson, Johnson Street, Germantown Avenue. And the Chews owned nine plantations in Maryland and Delaware, and they sat right here in Philadelphia, and they took care of all of that. So that's a history that we are not really aware of. And then I went to the Art Museum, and I'm a docent of workhouse guides at the Art Museum, and they were not telling these stories. So I just sort of delved in because all of these houses, in some way or another, have some sort of history with the African Americans at the time. And I just kept digging deeper and deeper, and now here I am at Strawberry. <laughs> But I'm still involved with all the other places that I just mentioned. So, Can you tell us about the committee of, what is it, 1926? The committee of 1926, I'm the president of the committee of 1926. And in 1926, a group of women got together because it was the Sesame Centennial. It was the 150th anniversary of the uh, signing of the Declaration of Independence. And they wanted some way to showcase the, the fair. It was a huge fair that was down near the Art Museum and Roosevelt Park. And I think there's an island out there called Hog Island. So they had this huge World's Fair. And the women wanted to be represented what they decided they were going to build High Street, which is now our Market Street. And they were going to show what High Street looked like in 1776. So they got together, and all of this furniture that you see in the house was in that fair. Not all of it, because we've acquired other things, but the majority of it was in that fair. And they were in separate houses that were built just for the fair. The fair was only six months. And after the six months, they had all of this furniture, which is, you know, <coughs> 1770 to 1850. And what are you going to do with all the furniture? So they went to the city and asked them, and they built them a museum, of course, the um, basic. So this is in all of the, the, um, the artwork that you see is from our resident who lives here. There is a person who lives here. And he's a hiker. So he hiked the Underground Railroad from in the Virginia area to Philadelphia. And then he went to the Ohio River area. And he hiked on that side. And he was just so overwhelmed with the beauty that he saw. And then he realized, and because we're a house of women, what? he got stories from the Pennsylvania Gazette. Mm -hmm. Not stories, but the one ads for women who have escaped and their owners were looking for them. And he superimposed them. You can see them. He purposely <gasps> made them so that they were sort of blurred. Mm -hmm. But this woman, um, one of, I mean, they're just so graphic, you know, they called her a wench. One woman was pregnant and they were offering, you know, $300 or whatever for her capture. So all of these paintings are what he envisioned. Did these women actually see the beauty that they were walking through or were they just so focused, focused on their freedom? When I mentioned that I'm going to all these Mm -hmm. Railroad sites, some of them are major. Yeah. I go, and it's like, focus. Oh, yeah. That's what I see. Yeah. It's like, what would it feel like? All you try to do is get yeah. point A, point B, but this is what you can get to this. Yeah. yeah. You want to read it? We have on the table you can go through, and because they're blurred, you can't see them mm -hmm. really. You can't read them very well. You but could, you can read finish them talking. Here. And all of these were in the Philadelphia Gazette which was Benjamin Franklin's paper, of slave owners who are advertising, if you see my runaway. Oh, and these are all women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Benjamin Franklin owned slaves, too. Mm -hmm. And then when he got older, he exactly. felt better, or was trying to get to heaven, I don't know. And we have Lewis's law books. This is Judge Lewis. This is a story that we tell here of uh, Charity Castle, whom he helped into um, freedom. 
She was an enslaved person at Clifton. And we, there's a whole series of letters that are um, around between, that the Pennsylvania Historical Society has. And we have all of the letters. We have copies of all of the letters. Uh, between Lewis, between the Chu family in Germantown, and then um, the Carroll family. The Carroll family in Maryland, because this is where Charity Castle came from. Um, she was actually owned by them. The Carrolls were signers of the Declaration of Independence, the uh, Constitution. If you ever go to Carrollton Station, they're well known. Their house, Homewood, is open as a house, and it's on the campus of the um, of John Hopkins University, so in Baltimore. Then this is where Charity came from, and he helped her um, obtain her freedom, and we think from this house, because she was at Clifton for six months, um, and he kind of ferried her down here, according to the letter. Who are freedom-seeking men and their story. So he started out with women because we're a house of women and this is the product. So you hired, so he came as a caretaker. So it's just fortuitous that he's an artist and Yes. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. A lot of caretakers are artists yes. because being a caretaker is sort of a strange, being an artist gives you time to to give back and maybe not have a nine to five job or be able to write to fulfill mm -hmm. the duties of being a caretaker, which are sometimes weird and sometimes have to be here at different hours mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So a lot of the houses have um, people who are more on the artistic side. So and, where is the apartment? Yeah. Yeah. It's upstairs. It's a fabulous apartment. Yeah, I've been. It's been it's huge. <laughs> Raise your hand. Raise your hand. So it's the brand. And he has to share the kitchen with the ladies. Yes, he has to share the kitchen. Did he find his maps and the trails? Did he find? Does he have a website? No, he doesn't have a website. You know what? I don't, he was out in the back. I'll see if he's still around. He can come and tell you how he did this. And I think he sort of tells the story in one of those panels over there, or maybe the butterflies. I don't know. But um, if I can find him, I'll let him talk to you and you can. And <laughs> yes. Yes, that is paper mache. That is done by a Philadelphia doll maker by the name of Lori Payne. Um, she does the raw sugar dolls. And um, we told her what our mission was, and this is what she came out. The chains are broken. Uh, Judge Lewis has the keys. This is the bill. Here is a, 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 a larger uh, copy of the bill that Judge Lewis wrote. And her skirt has the bill on her skirt. Wow. So she had to learn the history as yeah. an artist. Yes. She, she was given the history mm -hmm. she and was. distilled it or interpreted mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And what was this question? What did yeah, you ask? I'm sorry. He asked me about the dog, right? What did he? What, did what was your question? question? I said, how come they didn't take the dog? Okay. Oh yeah, they did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. It is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. He recognized that it was a dog. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's bring out. I have a good question. You know, my history. You, do we know uh, where his courtroom was? Was he one of the judges who spoke on the second floor of Independence Hall, or was there a different federal court at his time? No, he was in Independence Hall. Oh, okay. He was the chief judge of the state of Pennsylvania at George Washington appointed him. Wow. In, um, yeah. So he was in the Pennsylvania State House. Okay. So the federal district court. Ada. Yes, that's exactly it. Yeah. Stop. My, my question is, um, do you have any of the um, advertisements from the Gazette that showed the abolitionists ab uh, uh, work for the, the abolitionist ads that were in there? We, no, but we have some from New York. There was a New York paper, and I can't think of the name of it, and that's where we found all the Isaac Hopper stuff. Yeah. And the, this New York paper actually tells all of the ones from Philadelphia, and, 
more so than I haven't found it. Much money well, he, I mean, that Hopper publishes it much later. Right. So the yeah. incidences of his work, Isaac Hopper, who was part of the Abolition Society, he's publishing his stories from 20 years earlier in this New York anti-slavery newspaper. Yeah. Sort of like yeah. Harrison's Liberator. Yeah. So for a white thing, yeah, but nothing. nothing um, so, but, so the runaway ads would have been much more than the abolitionist ads. I would kind of think so. so. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. They the newspaper publisher. And underneath each picture, it. you can actually read what it says here. So I'm ready for I'm this ready challenge. For this challenge. And, I was and I was built for this. I think that, I think we, that all we all have a purpose in life. In life. And mine is going to take on a task that most of us back away from. from. Impossible. That impossible. So people, people say it's impossible. I see possibilities. I don't see anything, I don't see anything as impossible. being impossible. Mentality, mentality, there are different, there are different mentalities, mentalities, but just like just there's like different, there's ways, different ways to teach people, people how to read, there's, there's, there's different ways to communicate people. There's different ways, there's different ways to communicate people and their different mentalities. So I do so I do see hope. I see hope in that's all.